John Keane was born in South Australia and educated at the Universities of Adelaide, Toronto and Cambridge. As a professor of politics at the University of Sydney and at some other unpronounceable German place in Berlin, <laughs> in 1989 he founded the Centre for the Study of Democracy in London. He's a director and founder of the Sydney Dem Democracy Initiative and, and in recent years has held the Karl Deutsch professor Professorship in Berlin, co-directed a large-scale European Commission-funded project on the future of civil society and citizenship and served as a fellow of the London-based think tank, the Institute for Public Policy Research. His research interests include China and the future of global institutions, the tw uh, and, the, and the future of global institutions. The 21st century enemies of democracy, fear and violence, public life, power and freedom of communication in the digital age, religion and the history of secularism, philosophies of language, and why, what a, what a, what a, what a wide, wide collection. The origins and future of representative democracy, uh, of government, and the history and politics of Islam, and has published in many of these areas. A few recently published works include Global Civil Society, Violence and Democracy, and the Future of Representative Democracy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I can barely see you. Uh, a warm welcome to the card-carrying members of the middle class, surviving middle class here. I, I want in my time to, uh, this evening to get you thinking, to unsettle you perhaps, uh, also along the way to challenge the well-known sarcastic remark of the Irish writer and playwright Oscar Wilde that the trouble with the middle class and its intellectuals is that uh, we suffer a certain lack of imaginative thought, as he put it, a certain low passion for respectability. There are a lot of things that I want to say, the clock's ticking, so I have a half a dozen uh, key points to share with you to uh, get you thinking about this topic of the middle classes and uh, the future of democracy. The first uh, point has to do with exactly what is the middle class. You uh, may know that uh, the term itself has a history. Uh, it dates only from the 1740s, and it has changed through time, and it's a controversial category. It's not straightforward, and we should have a discussion about that tonight. During the 19th century, for example, it was uh, used as a synonym for capitalists, those uh, people who had enough capital that they could rival the nobility and uh, screw the proletariat. That was Marx's view. Uh, in the century before, the middle class uh, uh, was defined as that bit of the population wedged between the nobility and the peasantry. Into the 20th century, for the first time, a Registrar General's report in the United Kingdom defined the middle class as that place between the working class and the upper class. And meanwhile, you probably know the middle class has uh, been called everything under the sun. Max Weber, the great German sociologist, uh, described the middle class as the standard bearers of the Protestant ethic, the Protestant work ethic. There are those who were less uh, generous. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, for example, in saint Genet, uh, where the middle class is defined as uh, that nervous group that preaches against criminality, that sides with heterosexuality and generally has a fear of deviating from norms. Sometimes the middle classes are praised as standard bearers of reason. That was the view, for example, of Friedrich von Hayek, the uh, Austrian economist. And sometimes um, the middle class has been seen as dreamers. Uh, one of my favorites is E.M. Forster, the writer, who said that one of the definitions of the middle class is that they are those people who abide by the rule, in come the dividends and up go the lofty thoughts. Uh, so here we are. Today's statisticians, as you heard from Bernard Salt, are less inclined to a pâté les bourgeois, to use Flaubert's term. Uh, there is a, a considerable debate about how to define statistically the middle class. Uh, is it those people who live somewhere between the 20th or the 30th and the 80th percentile of consumption distribution? Uh, the World Bank defi defines the middle class as those people with incomes falling between the mean level in Italy and Brazil, 4,000 to 17,000 US dollars. An OECD report widely circulated defines the middle class as uh, those people with daily expenditures somewhere between US $10 and $100 per person and so on. The point is uh, here, the first point is that there's a definite 
arbitrariness about uh, these definitions. And what's uh, also important to realize is that, of course, none of these make reference to the self-consciousness of people categorized as middle class. In the end, all statistics aside, feeling or being seen as middle class and believing in tomorrow, one of the basic characteristics of a middle class may well be the most important determinant of how so-called middle class people behave politically. I shall come back to this, but for the moment I want to turn to a second uh, point, and that is to do with the evidence of the decline or expansion of the middle class. It certainly, this topic certainly needs to be handled with care. Uh, Frank Fukuyama has described the American uh, situation, but there is emerging evidence that this is a much more widespread phenomenon in the Atlantic region. So, for example, the Bertelsmann Foundation in Germany uh, quite recently has uh, pinpointed the shrinkage of uh, the middle class within uh, relatively wealthy uh, the German economy, uh, around a shrinkage from around 65% 15 years ago to 58% of the population. There are countries, for example, in the Balkans, Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, Serba, Serbia, where the middle class has actually shrunk to somewhere between 4 and 10% of the population and are often referred to as the invisible class, largely kept alive by foreign investment. The area, I think, geographically, where stern warnings about the disappearance of the middle class uh, and its potentially anti-democratic effects are hail especially from Canada and the United States. You may know that even a museum in memory of the middle class has now actually opened in uh, Schaumburg, Illinois, funded by the Ford Foundation, where uh, if you visit the museum, you can look at these quaint um, customs um, from yesteryear, such as free weekends, remember them, day trips, eating at chain family restaurants, and watching television and baseball together. A Canadian report emphasizes this kind of trend. Until recently, it runs, and I'm quoting, uh, the middle class was in a position that could be reached without grasping, often without a university degree, and enjoyed without too much worry. It meant a stable job, a house with a yard, a two car garage and perhaps a nice pension. But it's getting to the point, concludes the report, where having all of that could make you the envy of your neighborhood. So we see a trend, especially in North America, towards the loss of confidence um, in the future. The sense that saving for a rainy day belongs to a uh, previous age, that disposable income is uh, being reduced, that retirement plans are often in disarray, that there are disappearing pension schemes, and so on. And only a, a minority, it turns out, in this region believes any longer that their children will live as well as them. Now, Frank Fukuyama has talked about um, this uh, this evening, and he's written, uh, I think uh, it's among the very best writing we have about this, um, about this trend and its political implications. I think Frank uh, Fukuyama might be described as something like a class-conscious defender of the middle classes, of the liberal middle classes. And he calls for a new politics that some, stands somewhere between David Cameron's a concern for uh, the strivers, uh, Ed Miliband's talk of the squeezed middle, and Obama's talk of the need for a new economy where there's not a trickle-down effect or belief in a trickle-down effect of wealth, but actually where an economy grows from the middle outwards. Now, um, we've already covered this territory. I want to add, actually, a darker note uh, to this because it seems to me that the situation facing um, these middle classes in the Atlantic region in our times and for the coming years is rather grimmer. And it's rather grimmer for a couple of reasons. Uh, to do with, first of all, the, uh, the improbability of a return to what Colin Crouch, uh, the British sociologist, once called privatized Keynesianism. I mean, cheap credit that fueled uh, a property boom that gave the sense to many middle class people that they were becoming wealthier as uh, the days and months and years passed. With the collapse of that uh, near collapse of that banking and credit sector, the bursting of the bubble, it's unlikely that we will see a return to that period. Or perhaps it will, in which case um, the observation of Charles Kindleberger, uh, a German-American historian, becomes important. Market economies, according to Kindleberger, in a famous study, are prone to produce bubbles. 
there have been 11 major disruptive bubbles since the Dutch, Dutch tulip craze in the uh, 1640s, and seven of these have occurred since 1970. And the probability of uh, other bubbles developing in future must surely be high. There is also the point that if you look at the evidence, Frank Fukuyama uh, just raised this, that there is uh, some, some evidence available that the impact, the job displacing impact of um, IT um, is beginning to have uh, as well reduced productivity gains. That is the, the advantage uh, technologically of uh, investing in information and communication systems and the employment potential of that is actually in decline. Third point, this is all bad news for the middle classes but there is a, uh, an optimistic note in that we've heard the phrase already uh, there is a growth of a global middle class uh, taking place. What is important to emphasize is that this is principally happening, uh, overwhelmingly happening in our region, in the Asia and Pacific region. This is arguably the, the fastest ever recorded case of embourgeoisement under modern conditions. Um, its patterns of growth, the growth of this uh, Asia Pacific uh, middle class, doesn't uh, fit any standard categories. It defies nation-state boundaries. It defies north-south divides, talk of the West or the third world. So that middle classes in cities like Bangkok and Guangzhou and Jakarta and Seoul are interconnected. Uh, the numbers are massive. The OECD report, which I've mentioned already, uh, uh, points out that we're likely to see on all the evidence that we have an increase of this um, middle class, global middle class, from 1.8 billion people to 3.2 billion by 2020 and maybe to 4.9 billion by 2030. And almost 85% of this projected growth is happening in our region. Now, behind these predictions, of course, usually stands the presumed giant of China, where a very large middle class is crystallizing. The size of this Zhongchanjieji, uh, the middle class, is disputed. Some say it's around 12% of the population. Others project that it's growing to something like 30%. One of the great questions uh, in matters of democracy in the middle class is whether this middle class, heavily dependent on the state, will actually uh, choose to conform to that uh, one-party state, to what Min Xinpei calls a decentralized predatory state, or whether the middle classes of China will grow restless. It's a topic that Ben will take up, and I will pass to a fourth point. The key point um, uh, now is how reliable are the middle classes? Are they always uh, an ally of democracy? Well, there is a view um, that uh, goes back into the 18th century that makes us think twice. This, by the way, is a liberal uh, view by Gil Ray of a Democrat in the early 1790s. It's not a very pretty picture. Um, liberals were not Democrats at this point, and with great difficulty, uh, came to speak the language of democracy during the 19th and early 20th centuries. You can see that transformation in the Liberal Party in, in Britain. The view that the middle classes have a natural affinity with democracy goes back to Aristotle, the Greek philosopher. If you look carefully at Aristotle, actually he doesn't talk about democracy, he talks about a political community, a certain type of uh, political system which he uh, does indeed say needs a middle class. Usually the view is uh, put that there is somehow a, an affinity between the middle class and education. Caught in the middle, the middle classes uh, like education, they're in favor of reason, they're in favor of public life, they're in, in favor of respect for truth, for freedom of association. But in fact, the historical record teaches us to be more circumspect. I'm thinking here of a work, it's a famous work in the literature by Barrington Moore, uh, an American uh, historian, who must have written one of the pithiest, shortest sentences in uh, my field, no bourgeois, no democracy. That's often misread. Uh, to say, to, to, to draw the conclusion that, that a, bourgeois, a bourgeoisie, a middle class, uh, usually gives rise to um, a, a, some form of, say, parliamentary democracy. If you read Barrington Moore, he points out that actually under modern uh, uh, conditions, in fact, the bourgeoisie went in a number of directions. In one 
uh, scenario, for example, in uh, China and Russia, the middle classes were more or less annihilated. In another pathway, in Weimar Germany, for example, but also in Japan, the middle classes opted for totalitarian power. It was their outmaneuvering and their um, conviction that they should depend on the state that led them to reject democracy. It was only, for example, in the case of Britain or France that the middle classes uh, eventually went uh, for parliamentary democracy. We'd want, I think, to complicate this picture even uh, further, but what I'm suggesting to you is the political promiscuity of the middle classes. There is no uh, law, let's say, uh, of middle class democracy. It depends on the circumstances, it depends on the power conditions, and it depends, of course, on uh, decisions taken by middle class uh, people themselves. This promiscuity certainly applies to our region. If you read the novel by Tash Or, born in Taiwan, grew up in Malaysia, now living in Britain, five-star billionaire, you will see a picture of struggling middle classes in the 21st century who feel lassitude, who feel fatigue, who suffer political headaches, who generally are irritable, who feel that nothing stands still, that life is just constant elbowing, and it's as if um, there is some kind of bedevil bedeviling of their lives uh, by spirits, by strange spirits. And it's possible, it's just possible that this kind of condition will lead to uh, a rejection of uh, forms of democracy. I want to introduce to you a big idea. This is a Big Ideas Forum. I suggest that we're living through a very major historical transformation away from parliamentary liberal representative democracy in the form that my grandparents and great-grandparents recognized. Towards uh, this, where elections are the centerpiece, parliaments are the centerpiece within territorial states of democracy, towards something like this, what I call monetary democracy, a much more complicated form of democracy, uh, which in a few words, is a form, a new form of historically of democracy in which free and fair elections are, remain important, nothing less, but where democracy comes to mean the checking and balancing and public scrutinizing and chastening of power from a whole variety of new institutions that never existed before in the history of democracy. Um, there is, I think, evidence, this is my fifth and soon to be sixth and final point, that the middle classes show some interest in these new forms of democracy, that they have played, in fact, an important role in the building of this new monetary form of democracy. There are some symptoms of this. The fact that the middle classes are no longer party activists. In Australia, the Labour Party has remaining 8,000 activists. It was once a great political machine. Think of the ways in which, since 1945, the middle classes have actually contributed to the growth of new mechanisms that we now associate with democracy. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, peace camps, teach-ins, women's consciousness raising groups, judicial activism, bioregional assemblies, freedom rides, nonviolent coordinating committees of the kind that Martin Luther King was involved with. And more recently, in Japan, after Fukushima, middle class people have set up radiation detection networks. In Sweden, I read quite recently, middle class activists under the Occupy banner actually staged a bus safari through the very rich suburbs of Stockholm to teach the middle classes how the really rich live. And in Gezi Park, mentioned by Frank, what is interesting is the, is the growth of all these new mechanisms, monetary mechanisms, balcony protests, the occupation of public squares, sing-ins, pots and pans demonstrations, earth iftar tables, where people uh, break their fast uh, collectively. There is evidence as well that the middle classes are contributing to new forms of governance in city arrangements. The C40 initiative is a case in point. I'm um, being very generously treated by the bell ringer, so I shall stop uh, to uh, introduce and to summarize in a few sentences my sixth and final point. Could it be, this is a thought uh, for you, could it be that just as the middle classes, for example, in Britain and France and in the United States, plumped 
from the end of the 18th century through the 19th century till roughly World War II for a form of representative parliamentary democracy within territorial states. Is it just possible that some parts of the middle class, even parts of that suburban middle class that Bernard uh, Salt spoke about, the thinking people, as Hayek put it, is it just possible that these middle classes are the champions of a new historical form of democracy, a form of democracy in which arbitrary power is not tolerated because it's considered potentially to be the source of great injustice and evil? Thank you very much.